on to our uh, next session and our invited speaker, Andres Clarence. So I'm really happy to introduce uh, Andres, who works on ma um, carbon management uh, in his research. And uh, today he will give a more uh, a talk on his um, technical results related to precipitation and dissolution processes. His background is uh, a PhD from the University of Michigan from 2008, and he is now a professor of environmental engineering within the Department of Engineering Systems and Environment at the University of Virginia. He is also associate director of the Penn University Environmental Resilience Institute. His uh, research focuses broadly on anthropogenic carbon flows and the way that CO2 is uh, manipulated, reused, and sequestered in engineered systems. This is important for developing efficient strategies for mitigating emissions that are driving climate change and for understanding how infrastructure must be adapted. Now, today, he, uh, I know he will dig more into and explain more about technical aspects of, of these matters. So with that, I'm uh, really pleased to give the screen to you, Andres. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate that introduction. And I want to um, start off by thanking the organizers so much for inviting me to come. Let me share my screen here. Oh, my screen is... Okay, um, so I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, and um, I'm a I'm a big fan of Interpol. I'm only uh, sad that I can't be there with uh, everyone in person. I uh, became a, a fan of Interpol a few years back, around the time I started studying this particular chemical system that I'm going to describe today. Uh, when I had a, a good fortune of doing a sabbatical in Majid. Hazanadeh's lab uh, at uh, Utrecht University. And uh, since then, we have been uh, exploring the relationships between one calcium silicate carbonation reaction and the different uh, ways in which it can impact uh, flow and forest media. And so today I wanna highlight a few of those different ways for you so that we can get a conversation started about the importance of some of these processes in different systems. Before I do though, I wanna quickly acknowledge um, the remarkable group of folks that I've had the opportunity to work with over the past few years. A lot of the work I'm gonna talk about today was led by Dan Plattenberger here. Um, this is my current team. Emma just graduated and won the All University um, Undergraduate Award, which was really a remarkable achievement. Um, and here on the right, I have some of my faculty collaborators, um, including Catherine Peters, who some of you may know is the Department Chair in Civil and Environmental Engineering at Princeton. I'm gonna talk about a paper that just came out um, a few months ago that was led by by uh, Flo Lin here, who's now a professor at LaSalle University in um, Philadelphia. Our work is largely supported by the US Department of Energy. So let me start at the top and uh, give some of the motivation for the work I'm gonna talk about today. So um, some of you may be, uh, or, or that, that really focus on poor scale processes, may not zoom out a lot. My group has a, a, a systems level modeling uh, group um, in addition to what we do in the laboratory. And we sort of think about the, the large scale global implications of some of the research that we do. So this is from a National Academies report. Actually, it was also in a UN report that basically shows you know, global CO2 emissions and the fact that um, if we sort of wait under a business as usual scenario and let peak global emissions um, uh, peak around sometime after mid-century, uh, you know, that's obviously going to lead to a net warming that's that's un unacceptable and going to lead to all kinds of global implications. Um, so we have to bend the curve and we're seeing over the past year some really um, promising uh, goals being set to ha set near net zero goals. I want to draw your attention to the blue area here, which are net negative um, uh, emissions technology. So these are things that would actually net remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And a lot of folks within Interport community have been looking at geologic carbon storage for many years. And that's a key part of decarbonization activities. And increasingly there's folks looking at 
what role some of the expertise that we have within the Interpol community can be um, lent to folks that are exploring negative emissions. And so negative emissions comes in a lot of different flavors. And um, today I'm gonna touch on specifically mineral carbonation reactions, which are relevant for a bunch of these ways. So you can be talking about accelerated chemical weathering of rocks. So these are um, deliberate activities that will take um, primarily silicate minerals and, and weather them. Uh, geologic carbon storage, obviously doing these sorts of reactions in situ in the subsurface. Um, and then there's other folks that are looking at it in the context of, of soil carbon as well. And so the, the point here is that um, in all of these processes, uh, flow through porous media is a really important um, uh, characteristic and um, a common thread that uh, our community has a lot of expertise to bring to bear. Um, if we look at uh, mineral carbonation specifically, the chemical reactions, I'm trained as an aqueous geochemist. So um, a lot of the results I'm going to talk about today are experimental in nature, but I'm also going to talk about some modeling work because um, I know that that's of interest to a lot of folks in this community. Um, if we look at the sorts of materials that we can carbonate, uh, they are very varied. Uh, some are natural, some are industrial byproducts. This uh, graphic shows the storage capacity. Um, you know, it's a conceptual graphic, but it, it really helps uh, bound the question of, you know, how much stuff do we have out there to carbonate and, and where. Some of it is, um, is actually, uh, you know, sort of naturally occurring geological um, materials. Some of it is industrial waste. So you see um, slags and cement waste and so forth. Uh, and then natural is up here. So when you stay to the log scale, so when you start getting up into the single and tens of gigatons per year CO2 storage, you're largely talking about these natural materials. And so understanding these is really critical. And then of course, obviously with all carbon management, um, the cost of doing it is also of great importance because there's alternatives. Mineral carbonation is only one of many different ways in which we can remove CO2 from the atmosphere. And so, um, you know, their natural processes, uh, there are, there's direct air capture is, is uh, receiving increasing attention, both in the US and in Europe. And so, um, you know, we're unlikely to ever do things that cost hundreds of dollars per ton CO2 removal. The things that cost tens of dollars per ton CO2 removal may very well be in play. And so understanding both the capacity and the cost is really critical. And um, so today I wanna to talk about some of the work we've been doing in our lab and um, how the lessons we've learned uh, can help inform some of these processes. So the chemical system that we've been concentrating on is, is that of uh, model calcium silicate um, uh, will last tonight and, um, and then uh, pseudo will last tonight, which has the same um, chemical structure. So it's uh, CaSiO3, um, so but different crystal structure. So same stoichiometry, different crystal structure. So they're called polymorphs of one another. And it turns out that, that um, even though they're the same chemical structure, when you react them um, under different conditions, you get very different products. And so many of you in the audience may be aware that when you carbonate a silicate, you tend to generate carbonates as your products. And carbonates are um, products that can then subsequently re-dissolve. So um, ca uh, calcium carbonate in particular, if you, uh, um, if you expose it to an acidic solution, such as a uh, water or brine with CO2 in it, it will re-dissolve. And so um, this reaction here constitutes the, this is what, what led me to, to sort of the title and the overarching theme of this talk is thinking about situations where you have flow, dissolution, precipitation, and then redissolution and more flow. So I call this a, a reinforcing loop. I was teaching a class on systems thinking when I made the title for this. So I was thinking about these, this is, a, this is terminology that's borrowed from the systems uh, thinking uh, literature and, and system science. So the point here is that you can have um, maybe delayed flow, and uh, but but ultimately you get more flow because the the precipitates that are blocking your flow initially will re-precipitate and move further down through your through your domain. 
Um, that stands in stark contrast to uh, materials where you produce products. And I have question marks here because um, we're still in the process of understanding all of the different products that can form here, but they tend to be called, uh, they, they tend to be of a broad class called calcium silicate hydrate materials. They're crystalline in general, and they are not uh, they're, they're, they're generally very stable under low pH conditions. So they will generally block flow. So that is uh, what in systems analysis you call a balancing loop, which means you have flow, dissolution, precipitation, and that's it, it stops. So it will block flow. So um, our interest is understanding both the, the geochemistry of these processes and then understanding how the geochemistry influences the flow of um, fluids through porous media where these, um, where these mineral phases may exist. It's important to point out that when I talk about flow here, I'm generally talking about fairly low um, advective flow. So most of the experiments I'm gonna talk about today are under diffusive conditions. Um, so high damp Kohler numbers uh, where you just don't have um, where you don't have a lot of flow, but that's mostly been to try and really understand the, the processes and also be able to control the, um, what's happening. So, um, you know, the, the, this, this process of carbonating pseudoelastinite and getting non-carbonate uh, uh, precipitates is actually something that's only been known for the past few years. So our group stumbled on this as, you know, many scientific discoveries tend to occur where you say, hmm, that's weird. Those don't look like carbonates. And so you can see it most distinctly if you look at SEM here. So on the, um, in panel A, you see a, um, a calcium carbonate phase. So very distinctive blocky um, uh, morphology. On the in, the in some of these other images, you can see down below in B, you can see aragonite. So that's another, that's a polymorph, right? Calcium carbonate. Um, but then over here in C and D, you can see these platy or plate-like or needle-like structures that were definitely not carbonates. And so we characterize them using a variety of different techniques, using EDS, using TEM. And we were able to confirm that these were crystalline calcium silicate hydrate mineral phases. And um, the exact chemical conditions that um, uh, that led to the formation of different CCSH phases um, is, is one that we're still sort of fully characterizing. But this observation that you can get these um, different phases depending on what the crystal structure of your parent compound is, was one that led us to sort of try and uh, speculate about what the underlying um, mechanism is that's driving these. And so this is just a schematic from a paper that we published in late 2018, um, where we explore sort of um, the dissolution processes of the parent compound and the, how that can lead to different concentrations in the aqueous phase and consequently different daughter products. Um, and we were not the only group at around the same time it totally independent of one another to make this observation. So it's kind of funny the way science works, right? So there was a group in Germany um, that was coming very much out of the cement uh, background that sort of made this, this same, uh, in, in, you know, in different language and different ways, they made the same type of observation. This was also in 2018. And then in 2019, a year later for pseudo-elastinite, um, Carlos Rodriguez Navarro's group in, at um, uh, the University of Granada made the same observation for pseudoelastinite. And so they were looking at it from a geologic carbon storage background, which is similar to ours. Um, but they were, they were really interested in the geochemistry as opposed to the connections and Im implications of this chemistry for flow and porous media. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about uh, here. Um, so uh, in our experiments, in subsequent papers, we really wanted to understand how this chemistry would impact flow. And so there's a lot going on here. So let me quickly walk you through it. So we, we did um, uh, experiments where we put uh, this material in a packed column of sand uh, into high pressure vessels uh, with CO2 in the, um, in the water. And then it was the, the columns were open at one side and closed at the other. So there was diffusion into the column. This is what the columns look like. This is how we measured permeability. At the end of the experiments, we were able to epoxy these and then section them and then take them to the synchrotron. So we went to Argonne National Lab outside of Chicago 
and we did um, we did uh, micro XRF maps is what what's shown here. And because this is a high energy synchrotron, we have to um, dope the samples with heavier elements to be able to see things. And so there's two two elements that we doped our samples with. Um, we doped them with strontium because that gets substitu substituted for calcium in the formation of carbonates. So where you see green, that's calcium carbonate precipitating out. Um, and where you see blue, this bromide, we added this to the water um, and uh, basically just the salt, but it shows you where water is able to go. So what we found is that you could carbonate these materials. Um, and like I said, again, uh, earlier, uh, the, the specific chemical conditions that exist within the pore space in these, in these materials very much drive the system towards forming carbonates or towards forming these crystalline phases that are not sensitive to pH. And so if you just add CO2 into these systems, you get a lot of carbonation, right? And these are, these are relatively short experiments. So you get a lot of carbonation, but that doesn't block flow particularly well. So you get a lot of water precipitating into or, or able to, to diffuse into your column. Um, in stark contrast, when we added a little bit of calcium or so, sorry, sorry, sodium hydroxide to buffer the pH of these systems and drive the system more towards these calcium, um, these, these CCSH phases, you know, these non-carbonate phases, what you get is a little bit of, of carbonates forming at the top, but right in this phase right here, you get a lot of these CCSH phases forming and these phases effectively stop flow. So this is how far water is able to get into this column under the same conditions you get um, you get blockage of flow. So um, I see that Majid has raised his hand, uh, but I don't actually know how to call on Majid. Is that, are we, how, how are we doing this, Inga? Are we, are we answering questions halfway I through? Think, Other people are raising their, or do we wait until the end? I'm, I think, I'm I think we wait until the end. I think that's Okay, easy. okay, okay, okay. Majid, hold your horses. We'll get, we'll get to you here. All right, so, um, and then over here we have unrea uh, an unreacted column. So you get basically no carbonate precipitating and water is able to move through the column uh, very, very easily. Um, we're able to actually measure this. So here's air, air permeability um, uh, measurements that show on a log scale that show when you have these CCSH phases forming, you um, get much more significant drops in permeability than if you only have carbonates forming. Carbonates do block flow, but not nearly to the same extent that the CCSHs um, uh, do. And so here you can see that um, I mentioned earlier when I had that schematic drawing of precipitation of dissolution precipitation and then redissolution, um, that's sort of what, what we get. So if we did long experiments, we got this uh, reactive front moving through the column where there was precipitation and then dissolution of the carbonate but over longer time series. Um, and it wasn't piston flow because obviously there were preferential flow paths, but you got this behavior in your column where, um, where the material was able to um, proceed further in. Uh, this, uh, this, this effect was explored um, looking by, by adding acid to the columns as well at different pHs after the um, after the reaction had taken place to look at explicitly the role that redissolution of these precipitates would have. And so what you see here is again, expli you know, explicitly the, the way to think about this is CO2 only is carbonates, CO2 with a little bit of, um, of base added really drives the reaction towards your, um, uh, towards your CCSH phases. And so you get a much more significant drop in, um, in permeability and that that drop is much more permanent. So you get a, a small effect from acid redissolution, but not nearly the same as when you have a system that is, is dominated by carbonates. And the reason for that, you can see uh, by looking at the morphology of these pores. And so here we have, uh, these are sand grains we're looking at, the big pieces. This is zoomed into like a single pore. Um, so these are sand grains here. And on the left, you have uh, carbonate crystal growth. So carbonates tend to precipitate out 
fairly uniformly throughout the pore space. And you can see that in these images, right? So you can see that the, the carbonates grow, but they grow fairly indiscriminately throughout the pore space. And that's in stark contrast to these CCSHs, which tend to crystal, they tend to grow on top of each other. So you get some, some nucleation along the surfaces, and then they tend to grow and block these pore throats much more effectively than the carbonates. So that was, you know, um, anecdotally, that was one of the distinctions that we really noticed when we were looking at these um, in much closer detail, the fact that, you know, you were getting some in the poor bodies, but most of them tended to grow in the poor throats where they were able to sort of um, aggregate and cross. And then that in turn had a much bigger impact on permeability than the formation of the carbonates. It's not just that the, um, that the right-hand side here is more stable under acidic conditions. It's also the nature of the crystal growth that led to these decline in, in permeability. So um, some of these results we published a couple of years ago at the end of 2019. And um, you know, as far as uh, what these phases are, like I said, it's they're mixed phases, even though we're starting with these really idealized calcium silicate high, um, uh, minerals, we are um, generating a variety of different phases. Tobamorite might be one way to think about this as kind of like an idealized um, calcium silicate hydrate, uh, but we're seeing other phases as well, some of which incorporate CO2, some of which don't incorporate CO2. And so um, understanding this precise mechanism is very much a focus of, our, of what our um, group is doing now. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that is in a moment. So um, at the same time that we were doing our experimental work, we also uh, really wanted to try and model the dynamics associated with how this chemistry would impact flow in a real, um, in a real subsurface uh, environment. And so here we have a, um, uh, the results of a paper that came out earlier this year. Again, this was done in collaboration with Catherine Peters group at Princeton. And um, what we did is essentially, uh, this is a schematic of the subsurface thinking about a leakage site or um, a, 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 the plume migration in the subsurface. And so we wanted to understand how these processes might uh, play out um, and the dynamics associated with all of the things that we were uh, observing in the lab. And so uh, the, the domain that we modeled is very similar to the domain that we that I showed you a little bit ago. So small, you know, centimeter scale columns um, that uh, had diffuse, primarily diffusive transport occurring in them. And so uh, here is a, a schematic of what that looks like. So these are actually results. These are results at the top from the synchrotron. And then down below, we have modeling results where we can show after a certain period of time, you get these products of calcium carbonate and, and um, amorphous silica, which are the the products of the carbonation of pseudoelastinite. And um, you know, uh, one of the, the processes that we wanted to understand was how the volume, the volume fraction of these minerals would um, impact uh, flow. And so um, when comparing the, the, the generation of uh, calcium carbonate versus CCSHs, there was um, uh, this, this sort of evolution in time where initially you get a lot of calcium carbonate forming. And again, very distinctive here. You can see the blocky characteristics of these phases going into CCSHs and then the, the parent compound, which is pseudoelastinite here. And we were able to, to, um, to simulate and, and balance this sort of chemical kinetics, idealized chemical kinetics with the, the um, uh, uh, flow conditions in these, in these uh, situations. So again, um, as with the experimental work, we compared um, conditions where there was some uh, base added to sort of buffer the system and drive it towards CCSH formation as opposed towards um, carbonate formation. And so that's what the with and without uh, 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 sodium hydroxide uh, indicates here in the left and the right. And so what we're able to do is, is um, simulate the total concentration of carbon and then the volume of carbonates that forms as a function of time and look at critical time it would take uh, based on what's known ideally of the um, chemical kinetics of some of these processes and then also look at that in the context of, um, of diffusion. And so we, uh, we, we were, you know, this is a, a fairly complicated system, to be honest, if you consider the fact that you have to model the dissolution, which is actually somewhat straightforward, the concentration of various different phases. And so you have that here. So you have all your carbon phases in solution, you have your dissolved calcium, you have 
your sodium, which is a, um, a good surrogate for pH. Um, and then you have uh, you have your saturation index. So trying to understand when these things are gonna precipitate out. For those of you that study and, and play around in these systems that involve precipitation dissolution, you know, the dissolution process is much e generally much easier to understand than the precipitation process because you get some of the crystal growth dynamics that I showed you in those experiments earlier. And so understanding you know, the saturation index and when things start to precipitate, that was one of the big challenges associated with this modeling activity was getting that right. And since we had this ground truth um, experimental work that we were able to use to help um, calibrate our, our modeling work, it was a really um, it was a really productive activity because we knew what was happening, we knew what should be happening. And so we were able to explore this relationship between saturation index, when things precipitate out, um, the volume fraction, and then how that impacts porosity and ultimately the permeability. And so here on the right, we have uh, these graphs that show uh, as a function of time, how if you have carbonates, you get a little bit of a drop in permeability eventually over time, but nowhere near the types of drops in permeability that you observe if you're able to um, steer your system towards the formation of some of these more stable calcium silicate hydrate phases. So um, we did this, uh, we did these, uh, th again, this work was published earlier this year and um, we did some, you know, no uh, flow and porous media paper would be complete without some uh, XCT work. And so we did some XCT to look at pore connectivity, but the, um, the majority of the experimental work that informed these models came from the synchrotron. Um, and so what we were able to show was that um, depending on how we um, control the conditions in this system, we're able to, to steer it towards lower permeability or higher permeability by forming CCSHs or not. Uh, I want to talk really quickly about um, some two more applications of this exact same chemistry um, that have been published in the past year uh, so that um, so that you can sort of put it in context a little bit more completely. So this is the way I actually started thinking about some of this chemistry. Uh, and this is work that I did, uh, started uh, way back when I was in Majid's lab um, and uh, we've recently published it. The idea here was understanding when and how to deploy this chemistry to block flow in the subsurface. And so um, obviously in geologic carbon storage contexts, you want to um, maximize permeability because you wanna be pushing as much CO2 into the subsurface as possible. But under certain conditions, like when you have a leakage event, you wanna be able to block flow. So one of my grad students over the past few years uh, spent some time developing or applying organic coatings that are temperature sensitive that would allow you to um, uh, deploy this chemistry only in places where a leakage event had happened. So in the subsurface, it gets cooler as you get shallower. And so the idea was that if we could create nanoparticles that had these minerals at the core that had an organic coating that rendered them unreactive in the target formation, but only available to react um, during leakage events, uh, that you could get a, a, a technology or an approach for for essentially sealing leaks from geologic carbon storage sites. Um, and so uh, this is the concept. These are the, these are the organic coatings. And um, uh, this is a lot going on in this graphic, but this summarizes all the results we got. So let me just quickly explain what these results are from, from our paper that came out last, early last year. So the basic idea here is that if you have an uncoated, um, if you have an uncoated uh, calcium silicate uh, phase and you carbonate it, you get um, uh, some drop in permeability um, and a lot of mass gain. The dark area here are the, the precipitates that, that fall out. So this is un, uh, at high temperature, right? Um, at high temperature, a coated particle, you get um, very much less, comparatively less reaction because this organic coating is protecting the core. So it's not allowing it to react with the CO2. And so it's staying intact. Um, at lower temperatures, what you get is again, a lot of um, uh, carbonation and drop in permeability, but at these low temperatures, the organic coating essentially renders the core of the, of the nanoparticle reactive. So it doesn't protect it. And so you get 
similar types of reaction rates uh, and similar types of permeability drops. So the two here at the bottom, you want to compare these two, right? I love, this would imagine this is like um, a, a well bore environment where it has it has the the fluid has come up along the well bore near the surface. Suddenly, this material is available to react, and it will precipitate out, and it will block flow. Um, whereas here in the in the the target formation, there's a big difference. So the organic coating is protected the middle. So we played around with this and thought about it from a design perspective, uh, perspective how particle size and a bunch of other factors um, uh, come to, to uh, play in, in, in thinking about these, how these can be um, engineered nanoparticles in, in the subsurface. Okay, so last application of this chemistry that I want to mention uh, is what, uh, what we're saying. Yeah. Our time is almost up. So. Okay. This will be one minute. So um, a lot of the work that we're doing right now is really focused on understanding the application of this in, in alternative cement materials. So for those of you that don't think about cement right now, very much cement is about six to 7% of global CO2 emissions. And um, so it's a big problem and there's a big need to develop new materials. Um, and it turns out that the calcium silicate hydrochemistry that we're studying can be applied to make low carbon cements. And we published on this first last year. And the basic um, reason that I wanted to connect some of this chemistry that we've been doing in the subsurface to cements is because in this context, you actually need to control the fluid flow, these are cured materials. So you need to control fluid flow to drive your systems towards um, uh, full reaction um, under as quickly as possible. So you, you want to be able to carbonate these, get them hard, get them to be low permeability. And so the constraints on our problem and how we're doing this have really changed from uh, the subsurface where you want to block flow to a cement material where you want to accelerate flow. And um, this is most critical when you start thinking about scaling these materials. So these are for precast cement, cementitious elements, right? Which are a growing segment of the market. Uh, these are things that are made in a factory that you can carbonate, make these materials that are very low carbon. Um, but in order to get from something that is a few centimeters to a few, um, you know, this is a this is a couple of inches cube that I show that under the wrong conditions, they essentially melted during the carbonation process because we didn't control it. And so getting from smaller samples to larger samples is really requiring us to think deeply about these processes and to control them. And so um, ultimately, I guess my, my message is that understanding these dissolution precipitation processes and how they interact with fluid flow is really critical for a variety of different contexts that are important in decarbonization um, and that range from geologic carbon storage through making alternative cementitious materials. And so with that, I want to thank you all for coming and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Andres. I think we, we, the next session starts in a few minutes, but I think we have we can uh, have a short question. And um, uh, let me see, Majid, uh, if you had your hand raised, I am now allowing you, you to talk. Maybe you, you move that. Let me see. Okay, so so he's not here. But but can I ask? So you were talking about steering these processes, and and sort of from a engineering perspective by adding this type of uh, uh, um, sodium hydroxide, et cetera, to this, is, where do you see the future going? Do you think this will be a, a viable technology in, in, uh, in the future? I mean, in geologic, yeah, so in, in geologic carbon storage context? Yeah. Yeah, so in geologic carbon storage context, I think in, in certain cases I could see it. So in terms of wellbore integrity, for example, where you're not talking about like huge volumes, but there are like questions about like long-term stability of these, these zones, I do think that there are opportunities. Um, and so I think that in general, 
Um, and, and then in, in obviously in the work we're doing in, in cement right now, you know, uh, there's, there, there's a huge demand right now for low carbon cements. And so if you can do this and obviously with cements also scale matters. So doing it cheaply and, you know, you can't say, oh, I just need, I just need a bunch of sodium hydroxide to make a bunch of cement because suddenly it won't be economically viable. But, um, you know, understanding other ways we might be able to control the pH in these systems, I think is really, really important. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so thank you very much again for a very interesting talk that I think this will be uh, also raises a lot of some new questions and challenges for for other related fields. So thank you very much again, and uh, yeah, uh, thanks to all of you for joining, and we'll move over to our next session. So thanks again. Bye. Bye, everyone.